That's Andrew Yang, avid whipped cream pourer and a Democrat running for president in 2020. As a full-service presidential candidate. Yang is running on the idea of a universal basic income, a policy which would give every adult in the U.S. $1,000 a month, which seems cool. After tons of research, we found out that money is awesome. But is it enough to unseat the nation's favorite former reality TV star? You're fired. I'm comedian Sierra Cato, and this is the story of Andrew Yang, a tech-savvy entrepreneur turned presidential candidate. Yang was born in 1975 in Schenectady, New York, to Taiwanese immigrants. His father graduated with a PhD in physics from UC Berkeley and did research for IBM and General Electric, acquiring 69 patents over the course of his career. Yang's mother graduated from Berkeley, too, with a master's degree in statistics. My father immigrated here as a graduate student and generated over 65 US patents for GE and IBM. I think that's a pretty good deal for the United States. That's the immigration story we need to be telling. Yang was set up for success. When he was 12, his parents sent him to the Center for Talented Youth, a summer camp for extremely smart kids run by Johns Hopkins University. In order to be granted admission to the camp, kids have to take the SAT. At 12 years old, Yang scored a 1,200 out of 1,600. He spent the next five summers there, improving his SAT score each time. The Washington Post notes, at 15, he scored more than 1,500. When he was applying for college, he didn't bother to take the SAT again because his score at 15 was good enough for even the most elite school. Later, he attended the elite boarding school Phillips Exeter Academy, the same high school billionaire and Democratic opponent Tom Steyer went to. Thanks, Andrew. No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> His parents paid the school's tuition, which at the time was around $17,000, or over $32,000 in today's dollars. Yang stood out from his peers at the expensive, blazer-heavy New Hampshire school. He donned a trench coat and listened to the tasteful palette of post-punk wave artists like The Smiths, New Order, The Cure. But what really set him apart from his peers was his knack for the debate stage. He shined on the school's debate squad and eventually became a member of the 1992 U.S. National Debate Team. It's a skill he arguably hasn't used all that well, but we'll get to that. Yang continued on his executive-centric path and went on to attend Brown University and later graduated from Columbia Law School in 1999. Yang landed at the corporate law firm Davis Polk & Wardwell, making $150,000 a year. But he quickly realized, as the Washington Post reported, he wanted to be the person creating businesses and deals, not the person writing the contracts. Five months after taking the role at the law giant, Yang left. Along with a co-worker from the former firm, Yang co-founded Star Giving, an internet startup that worked with celebrities to help raise money for charities. Star Giving had some success, but when the first tech bubble burst, so did Star Giving. Soon, he landed on his feet. After bouncing around from software company to software company, he became CEO of a prep testing company called Manhattan GMAT. Nearly a year after becoming CEO, the recession hit and 2.6 million people lost their jobs. But it was the greatest thing that could have happened to Yang. He told Slate, as all these young people lost their jobs, a lot of them turned toward business school, and he capitalized. Yang started selling an LSAT course in addition to the GMAT and raised the price of the testing program from $100 to $1,490. According to a BuzzFeed news report, while with the company, Yang was accused of discriminating against a woman after she allegedly found out she was paid significantly less than two of her male colleagues. The spokesperson for Yang's campaign responded to the allegations. Like many CEOs, Andrew Yang has had the unfortunate task of letting staff go who did not meet the organization's standards. The information provided by the letter writer does not reflect the reality of the situation. A second woman came forward with allegations of discrimination. The second woman allegedly got fired after getting married, and Yang, according to her, assumed she wouldn't work as hard. He claims the allegation is completely false. There is zero truth to it, I'm happy to say. I've had so many phenomenal women leaders that have elevated me and my organizations at every phase of my career. And if I was that kind of person, I would never have had any success. Yang eventually sold the company to the testing giant Kaplan, which made him a millionaire. He stayed on during the acquisition before funding his own venture in 2011, a nonprofit called Venture for America, an accelerator meant to build startups in emerging U.S. cities and not in traditional startup hubs like San Francisco. Critics claimed these aspirations play into a theme of elites saving the country, while ultimately failing to deliver on its mission. VFA's original goal was to create 100,000 jobs by 2025, but as a Recode report notes, it hasn't even created 4,000 jobs in about eight years of existence. And at that rate, it won't come close to 100,000. 
The company has since faded on its 100,000 jobs messaging. It's also struggled to get national donors, and its first few fellow classes were largely white men. A person close to VFA told Recode, If you're taking white male Harvard graduates and turning them into a Y Combinator founder, that's really cool, but I don't think you need my charitable donations to make that happen. Yang was eventually able to wrangle hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations for Venture for America from local billionaires, but it rubs them the wrong way. Critics of the practice claim that Yang wasn't speaking to the needs of inner-city communities, but rather the out-of-touch rich guys and gentrifiers. In 2017, Yang stepped down from VFA and announced his bid for the presidency. Upon hearing the announcement, his mom said, That's nice. Among other issues, the centerpiece of Andrew Yang's campaign is the idea of making capitalism work for millions of Americans who have and will continue to lose their jobs to automation by paying them, literally, by providing a universal basic income of $1,000 a month to all Americans dubbed the Freedom Dividend. Yang believes it will grow the economy and will be a good way to build businesses, reduce crime, help folks relocate for work, and stay healthy. Well, most Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. 57% of Americans can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. So you put $1,000 a month into their hands, it's going to go right back into the economy. After Google image searching $1,000, it seems to be a pretty fantastic idea, but not everyone thinks it's great. Critics of Yang's Freedom Dividend note that it would replace existing social welfare benefits like food stamps or housing vouchers. So you can either keep those or take the $1,000, but not both, which would divert money from programs that help the poor. Additionally, they argue giving $12,000 a year to 254 million Americans would cost $3 trillion a year and create inflation. To finance all of this, Yang proposes a value-added tax, or VAT, of 10% on the production of goods or services a business produces. Jeff Spross of The Week breaks it down. In brief, a value-added tax is a form of sales tax that's applied to every step in the supply chain. Exactly how business models pass along the costs of the tax is debatable, but economic studies are pretty unanimous that most of the burden gets handed off to the end consumer. Since lower-income households spend more of their budgets on basic consumption, that makes a VAT regressive. It takes a bigger percentage of poor Americans' income than of wealthier Americans' income. It's unclear if Yang's freedom dividend will work, or if he'll get the chance to make it work. Although he comes from an extensive debating background, he hasn't exactly stood out on the national stage. He's averaging the least amount of minutes spoken on the debate stage. It might be because he's not attacked, and he doesn't seem to ever go on the attack. Well, except for this. Do you guys enjoy trying to watch Donald Trump run a mile? That would be hysterical. What does that guy weigh, like 280 or something? And you see, once that guy try to, try to run a mile, it'd be like, oh my gosh, that would be so amazing for the American people. Uh, try and watch Donald. I, I say he like passes out at like the quarter mile mark. In many ways, he's just sort of there, preaching his freedom dividend gospel. But he's built a movement. Thanks to his massive online following known as the Yang Gang, he's been able to outlast bigger names like amateur skater Beto O'Rourke and former district attorney Kamala Harris. But the question is, can he gain ground? A recent Politico poll has Yang at just 4%, which, according to my calculations, isn't very high. It's unclear when or if he'll make a jump. Until then, this super smart dude with some solid ideas, no political experience, and the vibe of a cool boss who gets it, but probably sometimes crosses the line, has the nation talking about him giving them money. And that's worth something. Hey, thanks for watching Who Is? Did you know we have a podcast now too? On Who Is, the podcast, I'll dive deep into the fascinating lives of the people who run things, whose decisions impact every aspect of our lives. How did they get where they are today? And knowing that, what might they do next? From politicians to the ultra rich, to military contractors and monarchs and media moguls, I'll introduce you to the reporters and experts who know these real life world molders best sharp-eyed observers and confidants who observe our subjects as they make the decisions that define our everyday lives. To see more, hit the link or search Who Is on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. And for more of the video series you know and love, be sure to check out the Snapchat versions and our series playlists on YouTube and Facebook.